Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's Sunday again. That means it's time for Warrior Mode. I've got Bill Bean. He is in the hot seat. I am riding shotgun with him. And today, we have got back by popular demand, Travis from last week. We've got Travis on the phone with us today. So, Bill, it's going to be an absolutely information-packed, prayer-packed show today. There's so much going on, brother. Uh, where do we even start? We've still got another guest to bring on to the day, uh, to the show today as well. It's amazing, Kevin. Boy, once again, the week went by very quickly. Here we are again. Uh, hello to everybody out there. Before we start anything, I've got to say hello to Pearl. I'm sorry I missed you last week, my dear, but hello. I hope you're doing well. And and Kenny, I hope you're listening in too. And and God bless you both. And had to get that in, Kev. I couldn't forget your mom this week. Yeah, I got I got a stern lecture when we got off the show last week, Bill. <laughs> I've been in the bad books all week. No, I'm only it, joking. It will never happen again. I'm only joking, brother. She will be absolutely delighted, though. I know Kenny loves to listen to this show as well. And before Much I hand it God back to you, be before we come back to you to say. Uh, a, a, a swathe of prayers for people. Let us bring in our good friend Travis Short. Now, Travis was on last week to talk about the Mothman, and uh, considering I have done umpteen shows on that subject, last week's it totally raised the bar, in my opinion. Just the level of research that Travis brought to the table, and not only that, you can tell it's a case that genuinely intrigues him. So, Travis, we had such a blast last week. Myself and Bill were talking right after the show. It's a no-brainer to have you back on with us, brother. I'm really glad you can be here, and I'm looking forward to another well, show with you. Well, thank you guys so much for the invites to, to join you again. I had a blast last week as well. I always enjoy talking about Mothman and the research and, and all the things that transpired. And really, you know, it, even in a, in a three-hour interview with George Norrie on Coast to Coast, you still only get to scratch the surface of the things that we, that we uncovered, the things we talked about, and the directions that we were wanting to move uh, in future documentaries and even to the point uh, after Bill had had me contribute to one of his books, start, started thinking about actually writing a book about Mothman and, and combining a lot of the uh, footage and interviews that we didn't get to include in the first documentary and also the religious and, and the spiritual implications and the cultural implications of the sighting. And so I uh, toyed around with that idea, but it's great to be back on the show. I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to tonight. We were talking in the virtual green, green room. You know, the, the topic of serial killers has always fascinated me as well. Uh, the Night Stalker, Son of Sam, the Zodiac Killer, Jack the Ripper, Absolutely fascinated and cannot wait to talk to, to Laura tonight and get her input and insight into uh, into the string of murders there. Absolutely. And coming up on the show very shortly, we will have Lara Calhoun. She is going to share her research into the Night Stalker. And like Travis touched on there, Bill, I'll come back to you now. You know, I am, for whatever reason... Most people have an interest in these kind of topics, not because we find them fun. It's just we're intrigued. There's something about these cases of pure evil that really attracts so many people to look at it because it's so out of the, the normal, so out of the ordinary. And tonight's case, we've looked at some levels of violence already. But I think this guy tonight, he, he takes it to a whole new level. So I'm really looking forward to this, Bill, if that's the right way to frame that. But um, I'll hand it to you now so you can say your prayers because so many people out there have been getting in touch. Wow, yeah, and I totally agree with you, uh, your, your assessment of this. It's not that we're taking any uh, uh, joy in presenting these, you know, terrible, heavy topics. I mean, quite the contrary. I'm... Uh, both saddened and um, outraged as well that so many people lost their lives at the hands of uh, monsters like Richard Ramirez and, and others like him that took pleasure in killing. And there's no doubt in my mind that these people uh, were driven by demonic forces and also uh, their, by their own free will, 
they very much enjoyed doing what they were doing. So they uh, they were not only open vessels for the devil to work through to aid and abed, but they were very much willing participants as well. So um, I think these exposés that we're doing, I hope that it's shedding some light and I hope that it's educational for people. Look, it's I'd much rather be talking about other things uh, than serial killers and, and such horrible evil things. But uh, it's necessary, in my opinion, certainly in today's world, to know your enemy. So if we are claiming to have faith and, and walking with God and really walking in what I call warrior mode, that level of faith, strength, and courage, well, then we have to know our enemy. So. Uh, I think that it's it's really important for us to have these types of shows and expose this type of evil so people can know knowledge is power. So, and also you're very uh, right in that we are just overwhelmed with prayer requests uh, this evening for the show, and we're going to get to every one of them. And uh, I thank all of you for uh, contacting me and Kev as well with your prayer request. And it's very important to us, by the power of God, to get you prayed for. And we're certainly always praying and hoping for the best for you and your uh, family members and, and loved ones. So uh, let's start with the opening prayer. And Father, I thank you and praise you for this blessed and appointed time. And may you work through us and speak through us to present not only the truth, but to be a blessing to everyone out there that is watching and listening in right now. And Father, I ask that you keep everyone in your hedge of protection 24 hours a day, seven days a week for life. And I ask that you bless them with an abundance of love, peace, joy, good health, and prosperity for life. We give you the praise and the thanks and the glory, Father, for everything forevermore. In Jesus' name. Okay, so now we'll go right to the prayer list. Uh, we'll start it off with... Uh, Unfortunately, I've gotten some bad news here. Uh, my second cousin, uh, David Simons, and his wife, Diane, um, they both have COVID-19. Uh, they uh, currently live in Louisiana. And David has been in a COVID, a COVID unit for several weeks now. And um, we really need to pray for him because, unfortunately, it is not looking good for him. And uh, so, uh, Father, I pray for a healing miracle for uh, David Simons, and I pray that for Diane as well. And I ask that you bless them both with healing miracles and take that COVID out and off and away from them and bless you and restore them back to good health by your mighty power in Jesus' name, may it be so. Then we'll go right on down the list here, Kev, uh, praying for Herman Stevenson. He is currently hospitalized and uh, he's got a very serious problem going on as well. And I pray for a healing miracle for him. Um, Rhonda Brown, uh, she has suffered a devastating loss. Uh, her husband was killed in a car crash this past Wednesday, and uh, we pray that God will uh, bless and heal her and comfort her during this most difficult time. Our thoughts and prayers certainly go out uh, to Rhonda and her family. Uh, and then Mark Einstein, uh, he has been diagnosed with a tumor in his throat, a large growth. And uh, I pray that the, uh, number one, that the tumor is not cancerous. And secondly, I pray that God will shrink it down and just absolutely take it out and off and away from Mark. And uh, we also play, uh, pray for Gloria Saloki. Uh, she recently lost her daughter, Dana. And we pray for blessings and healing and comfort for her during this most difficult time. Um, we also pray for uh, Marnie Ryder. May God bless her with everything that she's needing. And uh, Lisa DeVito Stevenson, um, Elizabeth Rowan Roberts, Phyllis Clark, uh, Tina Marie. We pray for all of them. And Father, I ask that you bless all of them with everything that they are needing. By your mighty power and your mighty and holy name, in Jesus' name, may it be so. Uh, Lynn Dolan. Uh, she wants us to pray for Lisa, whose cancer has spread. She is uh, doing a very aggressive form of chemo. Uh, and we uh, pray for a healing miracle for Lisa. Also, uh, we're going to pray for Jolene, who has breast cancer. 
and is getting ready to start chemo. We ask for a total healing miracle from God for both of these women. Um, and yes, uh, again, we pray for uh, Nikki Hunt, um, who's battling cancer again. We pray that God blesses Nikki with a total healing miracle. Uh, Kat Gregory, uh, she's recently had a surgery and she needs prayer because uh, the surgery, there were complications from that surgery that she's experiencing now. And we pray for a total healing miracle for Kat. Um, Heather Branch, she needs prayers for her son who is uh, unfortunately having some difficulties in his life. And we pray that God will bless him and guide him uh, back on the right path. Uh, we pray for Regina Marie Colax. Uh, we pray for her family and may God bless them all with everything that they're needing. Uh, we pray for Julianne Schneider. Uh, we pray for her family and her husband Brent has pneumonia um, and he also has COPD. And uh, this is a very serious condition, to say the least. And uh, so we pray for a total healing miracle for Brent. And her daughter also has, uh, has to have a C-section. So we, we pray for her as well. We pray that everything will, will go well with that. Um, we are praying for um, Helen Francis Roms, uh, our good friend of the show. And then we pray that uh, God blesses her and her family with everything that they are needing. And, and may God break all the addictions off of her family. Um, we pray for Donna Buchanan Smith. Uh, her daughter, Barbie, uh, has been ill and is facing gallbladder surgery. And her boyfriend, Bill, uh, was recently diagnosed with inoperable heart issues and heart failure and has a mass under his left lung. Um, so we pray for them and, and may God bless them both with a complete and total healing miracle. And uh, we pray for my good friend, Tricia uh, Tuberty Dozier over uh, uh, with the Discovery Channel and, and all, of the, uh, all of the channels there. She's a veteran of, of all of those shows and channels. Um, we are going to pray for her husband, Steve, uh, his friend who has COVID-19. And uh, he's had it since March and he's still struggling with the fatigue and symptoms that uh, return periodically. And I hear this a lot, Kev and Travis, that uh, people that get this COVID garbage, um, you know, even after they're so-called cleared from it, these symptoms do return on the people. And so this man uh, is having these difficulties now, and uh, we certainly pray for him and, and pray for a total healing miracle for him. And again, that's from uh, my good friend, Trisha Tuberty Dozier. Uh, she's affiliated with New Dominion Pictures, who does everything for all the Discovery Channels and, and all those connected channels to it. Um, also, Let's pray for uh, David and Char Weigert. Uh, I pray for a total healing miracle for both of them. Char had uh, a massive heart attack uh, several months ago, and I pray that she is recovering uh, well from that. And I just pray that God will bless their finances and help them to get stabilized uh, financially as well. Uh, Susan Faber. Also, a request prayer for her family and for our nation. And yes, we are certainly praying for your family and our nation as well, Susan. Um, Kim Mailer, uh, she is a dear friend of mine, one of my former assistants, uh, wants us uh, to pray for the country. And uh, she just prays that the, the violence will stop. And, and so we'll end it right there. But I'll lead into something very quickly. Uh, I want to share uh, a tweet that I sent to the President of the United States last night. And I said to him, use your presidential power and stop the madness in all these places where this rioting is taking place. I'm telling you, it's getting so bad now, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this. I see the videos, and I'm sure you see them just like I do of uh, you know, good and decent law-abiding citizens in the 
shopping malls or grocery stores or wherever it may be, and they are getting accosted, they are getting beaten, some are getting killed. This is madness, and this has to stop. So I, this is what I said to him. Uh, you are the top law enforcement officer in America. Take swift and decisive action. You owe it to the law-abiding citizens of America. And he absolutely does. And so, again, if he or anyone that supports him thinks I'm wrong on this, um, and a lot of people say, oh, his hands are tied, he don't have power, this blah, 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 blah. He is the president of the United States. He has the power. And uh, he has military power in law enforcement. It's the posse comitatus. And whatever the president considers that unlawful obstructions, combinations, or assemblages, or rebellion against the authority of the United States make it unable to enforce the laws of the United States in any state or territory by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, he may call into federal service such as the militia of any state and use such of the armed forces as he considers necessary to enforce those laws to suppress the rebellion. So there you go. For the people who say his hands are tied, sorry, they're not tied. And he has the power to enact these things. And I say it's time for this to happen before this goes any further. I couldn't agree with you more, Bill. Um, again, I don't like to get too involved because I'm not American. Um, but as an observer from the outside, wow. Just wow. Um, I always thought he was going to be almost the great divider. We've seen it on social media in the build-up to the election. But to see where we are now, four, we four years in, coming up on an election, um, it's the lesser of two evils time. And both options are bad. You know? it's, uh, this is a time like no other, Kev. I'm telling you, this is uh, this is just unbelievable. So well, those, those I prayers. Say... I mean, those prayers that you had there today, right? I mean, Lydia. Endless. Yeah, Lydia, one of our previous guests on the show. Um, I was saying to her that it's insane. I mean, I, I do umpteen shows a week, and the most I get contacted is probably about this show. It's probably people that are reaching out. I wed Rhonda today, but there's other people as well, and they're talking about the show. They're thanking me for you saying the prayers and things like that. And the reason I bring it up is because we've talked for years now about the times that we are in, and I yeah. think the amount of prayers it's indicative of something, and that is that people right now are they're really under pressure, Bill, for numerous I, I reasons, agree. you know. I totally agree with you. And so this is why I say uh, to the people watching right now, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying or Kev or Travis, but I, I implore you to take the time, do the research. Number one, make your personal connection with God. If you want a real change in your life, no such change is going to come unless you are ready to come back to God and make him first in your life, and then you will see transformation and blessings. I can assure you of that. Uh, secondly, don't let any man lead you. If your relationship with God is like this, let him lead you. He will lead you to wisdom and knowledge, just like he did with me, far beyond anything that you could ever imagine in your life. But you have to be willing. And if you are a willing vessel and servant to him and for him, the rewards will be not only life-changing, but just uh, off the charts in the way of blessings. And Kev, before we go any further, uh, I've gotten three more prayer requests in. Wow. Uh, <laughs> let us play, pray for Karen Covington, uh, Audra Hen, and Brenda Stacer. Uh, and, and Brenda's saying, Please pray for Aaron. So we pray for Aaron. We pray for all of you. And, and may God bless you with everything that it is you are needing. And may he bless you and heal you and restore you and transform you as well. By the mighty power of Yahweh and his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, may it be so. Well, um, let me bring in Travis at this point. Um, what do you make of that, Travis? It's getting more and more people reaching out every week. Now, you could say the logical debunker out there would say, well, more people know about the show. But um, I think it truly is a sign of the times we're in, Travis. What do you think? 
Well, I, I agree, Kev, and I was going to say that two, two, two observations about something that you said. Uh, one, I actually do think and do appreciate your input and insight onto American politics because you're an outsider. We get blinded in this country. We, we, we follow a particular party line. We follow a particular individual, and it, I think, is refreshing from someone – who is outside of that country and that political system to be able to offer observation and insight. So I, I, I appreciate and respect your insight when you, when you make uh, comments about what's going on in this country, because I do think that that is incumbent upon this country that we are or have been the, the leader of, of the free world when it has come to technology, when it came to medicine, when it came to social rights and civic rights and, and racial rights. We, we tried to do a good job, and somehow along the way we are literally we're going backwards in time, 40 and 50 years, uh, to a time when this country was very volatile and very unstable. The second thing I will echo exactly what you said. Looking at the upcoming election, it is the lesser of two evils, and it is a sad, sad day in the country of the United States of America when we are voting for the lesser of two evils and not the best candidate for the office. No, um, you're absolutely right. And, Bill, my good friend Popeye, he put it to me as blatantly as he could. And it is, it's really kind of um, harsh, but the lesser of two evils is like asking somebody... Do you want shot in the head once or shot in the head twice? Bo both, Pretty much. Both, yeah, both results in the same thing, you know? It's crazy. This yeah. is where God I, must I do come agree. into it. Go ahead, Travis. And that's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. I do believe that what we are seeing, we talked about this, uh, uh, you know, Bill, you and, and Tim Rocks and I did on the show that, you know, people have long said they wanted a third great awakening in this country. Of course, the first great awakening came in the 1700s, the second great awakening uh, in, in the 19th century. But what is going to happen this time around is not going to be a tent revival. It is not going to be some church experience, but there is going to be a spiritual awakening of individuals who are forming a personal connection with God. I agree. And I do think that I think that shows like Kev's and, and like Tim's and that are exploring questions and exploring the the dark side of of our lives and lifestyle only so that the light can be shown and shed in those dark crevices. I do think more people, and especially during a time such as the pandemic that we're living in, more and more people are turning to podcasts and, and radio programs and, and other sources of news and information because shows like this, and I'm not saying this because Kev and you are friends or because I'm on the show, but this is a show that is not afraid to ask serious questions, but also deal truthful answers. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's based on, and that's what it'll always be based on, for the better or for the worse. Look, I don't want to offend anybody, and I think I can speak for both of you. You don't want to either. I love people. I want to do anything I can to help them. But if I'm not speaking the truth or speaking what I believe to be the truth, then I am uh, failing everyone that is listening, and I'm doing a disservice, and I will never, ever do that or be in that position. And, um, Bill, while there is people probably looking to reconnect with God at this time, it really is worrying me because um, you know that I'm quite outspoken on the whole QAnon topic. <laughs> more and more of the mega churches are now starting to play their congregation clips from the QAnon conspiracies. Yeah. Um, false witnesses, things like that. When you hear them talking about the Father, Q, and Donald Trump as the Holy Trinity, that's kind of crazy, dangerous talk, right? What, what's the first commandment? God says, you shall worship no other gods before me. He detests idol worship. We're to put our praise and worship to him only. He's the creator. He created us. He created everything. How could we give our praise and worship elsewhere other than to our creator? I, you know, so this is preposterous, and it goes right back to the scriptures again. In those days, even the very elect will be deceived, and they are. And, Bill, just before we get going, I'm, I'm going to send you a quick message here. And it's from one of our listeners. Um, Chrissy was her name. I don't know if it's going through or not, but she was talking about whether you've noticed the 
uptick in the Mandela's and the Bible. Lately. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've discussed Revelation 113 before um, about Jesus. Uh, in that verse, Jesus was portrayed as a commanding officer with a gold sash that went across his chest. And now, if you pick up the King James Bible and you go to Revelation 1, verse 13, it will say that he has a girt about the paps. That means a bra across the breast and a golden girdle. So they have tried now through these uh, uh, supernatural Mandela effect uh, scripture changes uh, to transform Jesus into a transsexual now. So, uh, yes, we are seeing uh, more and more of these changes taking place, and we're going to continue to see them because this is all part of this big pot that the devil and his demons are stirring. It's a cauldron. So all this garbage is inside of this cauldron, and the devil and his demons are stirring it up and stirring it up. So this is why we see so many different events taking place in America and the world simultaneously because of this full court press by the devil on the populace. It's um, it's bizarre to watch, Bill. It's worrying yeah. to watch as well. But um, I'll keep my eye on that. We'll, we'll certainly have to maybe talk about that more in an upcoming episode. But Maybe next week, yeah, yeah. we can talk about the uh, latest uh, scripture changes. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's shift gears in. Let's get ready for Lara coming on. The Night Stalker, Bill, how did you come to meet Lara? What what do you know about Lara? How's her, how is she connected into this case? Well, she's an investigative reporter. She's just started that now, and Travis and I have known Lara for years, and uh, she had a show, and, and uh, we were on her show many years ago. And uh, she heard us doing our show, and she sent me a message saying that she, uh, you know, could really compile a lot of info about uh, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker uh, serial killer, because she lived in that area and had ties uh, to him and people that knew him. So she's very familiar uh, with the case and very familiar with that area. She's also familiar with the Manson case and some people tied into that. So it'll be interesting uh, to hear what she has to say about now, all of this. Travis, I'm getting a real lot of feedback on your line. Is there any way you can mute up or? There it is, it's gone. There it is, it's... it was getting loud there, Bill. Awesome, <laughs> Travis. Thank you very, very much, brother. Apologies to anyone in the chat out there who had difficulties, but that's it, sorted now. He's a total professional. And what I'm gonna do is, Bill, I'm going to put us back onto this screen here okay. because okay. I need to dial a phone number and obviously privacy reasons. I don't want to be giving that out on the yeah, air. Sure. So um, now, wait a minute. How do I add into this call now? Um, okay. What I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to hang up on you and then I'm going to okay. call, call you both back, okay? Oh, perfect. Okay, stand by. Okay, we're still here, folks. We are still here. I'm still live with you, but what I'll do is I'll reset Skype because it's uh, plain silly beggars right now. And then I will reconnect Skype. I'll get Bill back. I'll get Travis back. And we'll also, by hook and by crook, or by crook, we'll connect with today's guest, Lara Calhoun, as well. So if you just give me two seconds here, folks, apologies about this, but we'll get it live uh, YouTube. It is great fun, isn't it? Here we go. So there's Bill there. If I phone that back. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so I've got Bill there. We're back. I appear, sir. There we go. Now give me two seconds and I will try and add in this number. Um, blah, 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 blah. And while you're doing that, Kev, I'm going to make two more, three more prayer requests here that came in. Uh, we're going to pray for Brenda Jones and for her kids and grandkids for their health. And uh, Kim Susan Crump, we're praying for her. And may God bless all of them with everything that they're needing. And uh, our good friend Valentina as well. And may God bless her with everything she's needing. She has some medical issues. So we pray for total healing for Valentina and uh, for everyone that we've prayed for. May God bless them with everything that they are needing. 
you know, Bill, this number doesn't seem to be connecting. Uh oh. Uh oh. We'll give it another try here. No, it's not letting me add in that number. It is um, an Tra uh, Travis, if I could, um, would you be able to call back in five minutes? Absolutely. Uh, I'll drop out. That, I'll that, try that's... just message me when you want me to call. Awesome, brother. Thank you very much. I think okay. it might just be because I've got one phone line connected that I've already dialed, but if you call in... That'll be a different connection, so if, just give it five minutes, Travis, and then call us back, okay? You got it, sir. No Talk problem. Guys, no problem, brother. Okay, so I'll try and add in this one now, Bill. Here we go. We will get there. Okay, add. No, that phone number is invalid, Mr. Bill. Okay, let's let's see here. Okay, I'm going to send you a message right now. Okay. You see, folks, the 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 usual Kev Baker show audience, they'll be laughing right now, Bill. <laughs> they know these technical things always catch me out, you know. Now it's interesting because I just uh, looked again, and it is the correct number that I gave you. And let's see. Is, okay. th is there... Hang on now, oh. hang on. Um... Okay. Okay, I'll try this time. Unable to add it. That is really bizarre. Is there a number that she could call? Yeah, there, in there certainly here? is. I'll um, give, give you that, Bill. I'll send you that over on yeah. Skype. Um, give me two seconds. We will get there. Big shout out to Lee Veltman in the chat room. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about the 17th letter of the alphabet, then Lee and John are doing absolutely brilliant work over on the john and lee show please check that out folks i don't recommend that lightly but um these guys have been following these criminals right from the start you know so most of what you hear me saying about them probably comes from these guys on little bits i've picked up along the way and um, i'm just getting this number for you now bill here we Kev, go. can you send that to the messenger yep because for some reason i there can't uh, there i got it okay there you go Sorry about this, folks. We'll be, we'll be good in a moment. We'll be good. We'll be back. There you go. At least you can see us again now. There you go. Our, our technical difficulties. Yes, exactly. We need a producer, Bill. Do, <laughs> do stay at this hair, Bill. I tell you, man, if they don't... Um, well, Tuesday, I'm finally getting a haircut. I tell you, I'm counting the hours down, brother. I feel like um, <laughs> Samson. I feel like I'm growing my locks out, you know? Well, that might not be a bad thing. Well, I have been told... Because he was a pretty powerful yeah. guy until uh, until Delilah cut yep. his hair. Of course, now, if you read the King James, it says that she called in a man to shave off seven locks of his hair. So it's no longer she cut his hair off. She called a man in to come in and just cut seven locks off. It's... Oh, Bill, where does it end? Where does it end? Here we go. <laughs> okay, so, Lara, are you with us? Yes, yeah. Hey, I am. Lara, it's great to talk to you. I'm Kev Baker, you and too. Um, I've got Bill Bean, your friend here with me as well, Bill. Hi, Laura. Hello, we, my friend. Sorry we had problems reaching you there, but it all worked out. We're, uh, we're always yes. moving forward, and by the power of God, we are always going to continue to move forward, and it will always work out. So, Absolutely. So, Bill, I will get you to kick us off with this the night stalker who he was and then obviously i'll let you bring lara in with her story her personal story about richard ramirez 
Yeah, I'm very interested to hear that. So again, you know, this individual, oh my goodness, Kev, I mean, you want to talk about wicked. Uh, this certainly, he would be right up there uh, among the most wicked individuals uh, ever in my lifetime. That, uh, I mean, this guy was Crowley-esque in the, in the sense that uh, he really enjoyed seemingly killing. And uh, he... Openly praise Satan. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure Laura will go into much more detail about this. Uh, he, his, his cousin, his older cousin was a great influence on him. His older cousin was a Green Beret. And uh, the older cousin did a tour in Vietnam. And by what I read, was uh, just a killing machine and also rape women over there. So he was a very evil individual himself. And he was a mentor for young Richard Ramirez. And uh, so we'll, we'll let Laura take it away from there with, with what she's got and what she's come up with. Absolutely. And I believe we're also rejoined by Travis. So that is absolutely fantastic. But Lara, right. let me come to you then, because Bill was telling me that you actually had some interaction with this character, Richard Ramirez, and you've done a lot of research into him. So I'm really keen to hear your take on the Night Stalker case. I was um, talking to Bill and Travis earlier, and um, we've looked at a lot of crimes lately. We've done the Manson family, we've looked at the Son of Sam, and out of all the cases, even away from the show, the level of violence that is on well displayed in this case it's really unrivaled in anything that i've looked at personally but i want to get your personal take on this story this character and your research into him yeah absolutely um well you know that old saying there's like that six degrees of separation from kevin bacon well it's a, kind of the same thing with me and richard ramirez um uh I moved to LA when I was uh, 18 years old, and um, that was in 1987. And uh, so, yes, I, if you do the math, I'm pretty old. <laughs> but, um, I've been uh, historically throughout my adult life, I've been directly related to the tattoo industry. My daughter's father um, was a, a famous tattoo artist in uh, Hollywood. And um, then as my daughter grew up and uh, w moved out on her own at 18, 19 years old, um, she actually lived in downtown L.A. And um, that's when we first discovered our first six degrees of separation, if you will. And uh, she lived there, like just a couple of buildings over from the old Cecil Hotel, which is now called the Stay on Main. And if you know anything about the Cecil Hotel, it's where that uh, Asian girl was found in the water tank up oh, on the roof. And, that, that's the most bizarre yeah. case ever, Lara. Yes, and it, it gets even more strange. That story in itself, we can actually do a whole show on that one alone. Me and you but, are going to um, get on very well, Lara. Me and you are going to get on very well. <laughs> I knew you would. Yep. <laughs> And so, like, that's, like, right there in downtown. Um, my tattoo uh, uh, studio was in the arts district. And my daughter and I were involved in going to, like, paranormal events and stuff like that and going to haunted locations and doing investigations and stuff back in that time. And right over the bridge, right into East L.A., is the Linda Vista Hospital, which is now, it was abandoned at the time. Now it's uh, actually like a apartment and it's for like older people. And I, and I, I told my friend who it runs the place and I'm like, are you people serious? I said, you're letting people that already have one foot in the grave live in this place. <laughs> so it's like, and mo that people don't stay. It's so haunted that people can't stay. They, they can't keep people in there, but but when it was a hospital, because I believe it, it closed down in like, um, I want to say 87, 88, um, Richard Ramirez was actually a patient at that hospital. And if you also know the story about Richard Ramirez, when he subsequent, 
subsequently got caught. He got caught in East L.A. And no different then as it is now, it is run by the gangs like the white fence gang and, uh, you know, Hispanic gangs and stuff like that. There's one in particular that I know of is called white fence. And so I also have a very dear friend of mine whose husband, who was very much gang uh, involved and he was uh, arrested and put in jail and he was in LA County. And that was right after Richard Ramirez had been arrested. And, um, he was in like a solitary, right? And my friend's husband at the time when he was in prison or in jail there with Richard Ramirez, he worked in the kitchen and, you know, they would, you know, make all the food for everybody. And each person had a specific, you know, plate or whatever. And um, the prisoners used to do the unthinkable to Richard's food. The unthinkable. They, I mean, feces, urine, and so on and so forth. Any kind of bodily fluid, they would put it in his food. Oh, wow. And, Bill, this is, um, you had another way of dealing with them, but uh, it doesn't sound like he had a good time in, in jail, that's for sure. I think you're muted up, Bill. I would absolutely uh, deal with him in a different way if I were the guy in charge. But, yeah, that uh, doesn't sound like he had a very enjoyable uh, stay in uh, in prison, that's for sure. No, definitely no. not. So what else can you tell us about him then, Lara? Well, I, I did a, a really deep dive. I, I'm not, like, from a very young age, I was always attracted to wanting to know what made people like him and other serial killers, what made them tick. So I read so many books. I have a fascination with them. I, I dated a police officer for eight years. So it's like, you know, I, I'm just, I'm into the whole crime, you, you know, learning about crime uh, and stuff like that. And uh, Let learning me... about Richard... Yeah, let me ask you, Lara, because when when I was looking into him today, um, the documentary that I watched was asking the question in its title, Born to Kill, um, Nature uh -huh. versus Nurture. Now, I heard in a couple of the documentaries, and I've seen before, that he was basically, I would say, my language here might be the wrong way to put it, but almost groomed for evil by his cousin. I think his name was Mike. He had come home from Vietnam, I believe. And um, Richard, from what I believe, he became distant from his parents, hooked up with Mike. And Mike was allegedly, I'll get you to speak to this, Lara. You've obviously done a lot yes. more research, but I was led to believe that Mike was showing him his kind of trophies that he took home from Vietnam, things like that. Is that correct, yeah? What he did was he took pictures of women that he violated and sexually abused and raped and and showed Richard Ramirez. I think it started like at the age of uh, 12. He started and Richard, Richard goes on to say that they didn't disturb him. They actually intri intrigued him. He liked them. And um, and that that is a problem. But let's start from the beginning. Um, Richard is the youngest of five children, and all five of his, him and his siblings all have a disability, mental disability, and they've discovered that while the mom was pregnant with each child, she was exposed to toxic chemicals, and I, I'm, I'm going to assume that must have been through her work, and and then, of course, her, her, or his uh, father was very abusive, and he, he didn't so much abuse the wife more than he did uh, Richard's siblings, and he had to watch that. And um, Richard, at the age of two and, uh, let's see, I think two and, and seven, I believe, he uh, had two major concussions, Okay. And he got, uh, let's see, two and five. I'm sorry, he was, uh, it was the age of two and five. When he was two, a dresser fell on him, and he got uh, over 30 stitches. 
And at the age of five, he, he got cracked in the head with a swing. And both times he lost consciousness. And both times he never received medical attention. So that was at a very, very young t- age. And um, then um, he started using marijuana at the age of 10. Who Whoa. does that? I mean, I, he, and there were no consequences to anything that he ever did. Like every time he would get in trouble, he, he was never disciplined by his folks. So n- nobody like, really, nobody <laughs> ever kind of set out that kind of um, discipline structure to him. He, he never felt any consequences for anything he'd done. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. He was never disciplined by his family. And then at the age of 13, you know, that cousin, Mike, Miguel, he, you know, was showing him all these pictures and everything. And then at the age of 13, he was beating his wife, the, Miguel, Mike, and made Richard watch. And, and Mike shot his wife in the face yeah. and thought it was funny. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I'm gonna he break... ended up, he didn't even, he, he didn't even get prosecuted. Like as a, he didn't go to prison. He went to a mental institution. He was deemed unfit to 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 uh, go to trial. Wow. Now, Bill, let me bring you in here, because um, th- this is why I kind of said he, he he was groomed into evil. And you think about that very formative years, ten to thirteen. He's hanging about with this guy. He's getting shown all these things. He's just becoming a man. He's just finding his sexuality. You would imagine, and and he's getting subjected to all of this pure evil it's craziness isn't it it is um and i'll say this i don't have any sympathy for the devil and richard ramirez was an agent for the devil furthermore um you know what laura's saying i can understand that you're taking hits to the head i took hits to the head as well as a little child several times and severe hits to the head um i lived a hellish lifestyle as well uh, you know, with the evil that was upon my family and I, uh, I hung around even as a child, some very dangerous and seedy people, believe you me. Um, so yes, I understand what Laura's saying, uh, about him, but each and every individual has a moral compass. I don't care who you are and from what background you come. And so we know the difference between right and right and wrong, and we can choose to do right or wrong. Believe me, there was a time in my life um, to where I was so dark uh, and so empty, I probably could have been a hitman. Uh, you know, as a, as a very very young man, I was that dark and empty and bitter and angry. Uh, I understand that, but at some point. Uh, we will either take responsibility for our actions and make the right choices, or we won't. And in his case, he did not. And um, and I had people in my life, very much like his cousin there, that were uh, really some seriously negative influences on me, again, to where it could have shaped my life. Had I chose to do so, um, I could have... Believe me, I could have ended up being a mercenary, uh, any number of things, and it wouldn't have been good. Uh, So I praise God for helping me to make those changes to become a good and productive citizen. Uh, But make no mistake, it had to be from my choice to do so. So there's where your difference comes from. And unfortunately, in his case, for whatever reasons, uh, he decided that he did not want to make those changes. Bill, the thought of you as a hitman terrifies me. Just seeing you at my door would terrify me, Bill. It really and I'm would. sorry to say it, but I'm telling you the God's honest truth. I mean, it could have really have gone in those areas, uh, you know, at a young age. But uh, I praise God for guiding me out of that because I was in those types of circles, believe me. Well, before I go back to Lara, let me bring in Travis here. Travis, what what do you have to offer after hearing what, what we've got so far? Well, first of all, Laura, hello. It has been way too long since we have spoken. I know. How are you? So good to hear your voice. I am doing well. How are you? I'm excellent. Good, good. I, it, it, Bill, it's like getting the whole crew back together again. It's like old times. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. And she's she's giving a fantastic presentation of this. I, 
She is. And Laura, I was going to ask a question, and, and I may be jumping ahead uh, of how you d- intend the interview to go. So if I am, just tell me to shut up and you can address this whenever. But out <laughs> of the other siblings, the, the other four siblings, did any of them show any signs of lacking morality and, and having issues with compulsions like Richard did? Not to his degree, I will tell you that. And that's another thing um, I wanted to bring up um, as far as Richard is concerned. There was a quote that that stuck with me so intently. And I made a joke about it, but it's, it's, it's not funny, but it was funny for me on my part, what I said. But he quoted, he said, I didn't give in to my desires. They crushed me. And for me, I was just like, what does he mean by that? You know, and I'm like, okay, well, for me, it would be like, okay, I have desires to have Oreo cookies. And I understand because sometimes I cannot control myself. So my desires crushed me into having that Oreo cookie, you know? So, I mean, like for me, that would be, okay, I can understand that. But, you know, um, they, they stated the judge, um, you know, they had to study him because he's not like any other serial killer that has ever been alive. And I'll go deeper into that. But, no, as far as, like, um, his siblings, they weren't like him. You know, I think that they are probably just unruly. Um, but they didn't have his injuries and his ex- his exposures, like, to Miguel or Mike, cousin Mike, and, you know, what Mike did to him, you know, bringing him in and, and just messing him up because Mike was just beyond help. I mean, he had from he, he he went in. I believe that Mike went into the military completely messed up in the head, and he just came back even worse. No, and let me. Well, it, it sounds like that. Yeah, and Lyra, I'm going to ask you because up until that point, the where Miguel Mike comes into the equation, listening to some of his old schoolmates. They, they were saying, like, Richard was one of the happiest kids there. He, he, everyone wanted to kind of hang out with him. And then all of a sudden, obviously, we had the mic coming along. And the next kind of thing you start to hear about him in school is that he's becoming withdrawn, um, hanging about yep. with older kids. Now, it's a, yep. I want to ask you, is that at this stage, he starts to dabble in Satanism? Or is that later on? Nope, that happened in high school. Um, he felt that he was um, the son of Satan. And, you know, a lot of that they tried to say that they thought it was just like all a show. But you have to understand that because he was mentally unstable after being like started doing drugs, smoking weed at the age of 12, we already know scientifically that marijuana burns your brain cells, right? And um, great, I'm glad it can make people more creative and funny, but it makes you stupid. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. But I, I know agree. That, uh, I agree with that. Okay, and I know that the CBD has some amazing homeopathic qualities that has nothing to do, or with you know the cannabis stuff is is healing and whatever. But you know, just to get high to get high for me, um, um, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't respect that. But um, he did it. He started doing it at such a young age. And then again, you, you, you talk about his age at the time when he started getting high. Yes. He was at the most impressionable time of his life. Right. And then he's being Im- impressed by this psycho, a complete psycho that he's supposed to trust. It's his family, his family member, Mike, you know, and, uh, he, he is a, he's a twisted wreck. And and he, I, I believe that he had to die, and and God took him out quickly, much quicker than the, our judicial system. And I think that was a show of mercy. I really do. Um, and what about him? Uh, he was also sleeping in graveyards. Uh, mm-hmm. He was so far um, gone with his parents that uh, he was incorrigible and this rebelliousness um, could not be tamed. And and so then he took to uh, sleeping in graveyards for a while. Yeah, I heard that as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's right then, Lara. Huh? He was actually um, sleeping in graveyards. I thought that was like maybe the story getting over embellished when I was listening to that today, but that really happened then? Yes, that really happened. And you know, like when I was a young teen, um, I used to have a motorcycle and this is out in the, you know, I, I'm from Texas. So this is like kind of out in the country. I was raised in a real small cow town outside of Houston and all the kids and us, we used to just, you know, run them up, you know, like, but in the most, like lame way I guess you know, I thought it was fun but everybody compared to the other kids in the city this is nothing but we used to go to the oldest graveyard there was two of them actually in out in the boonies and we used to play hide and go seek and I used to like in these graveyards and I thought it was cool and fun at first but then I started getting like really creeped out and then it got to the whole the whole level of like, you know, this is morally messed up. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing this. I feel like I'm being disrespectful. So I put a stop to all of that with all my friends. I told him, you can't be doing it. I'm going to tell your mom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, for him to do that, um, I don't think that it was a, a, about anything weird. I just think that that was his safest place to be because at that point he was homeless you know and he had nowhere to go where else do you go but where no one else will be you know and i just think that that was his choice to go there because he wouldn't get robbed or 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 sexually assaulted or or killed or anything like that because we're talking about east la or we're talking about uh where he's originally from you know and so, um so lara no, it, it, so. Get, it gets to 1985 okay that this is this is his kind of um, coming out year, shall we call it. Is there anything that you've been able to pin down that really triggered that that first event, maybe that gave him the taste, that, that kind of um, fed his desires, like you said, that he claimed crushed him in the end? What was it that really pushed him over the edge to get that taste at the start? I think the... The fact that he was looking at pictures at the age of 12 of tortured women and then watching someone get shot in the face and it didn't affect him is when it really kicked in, okay? And, um, you know, he dropped out of high school at 17 and he stopped um, worrying about his hygiene. Now, what they say, because, like, he doesn't he doesn't match the normal uh, if you will, the normal explanation of an actual serial killer. He had, for sure, he was um, narcissistic, and um, he had possible schizoid personality, but it wasn't proven. And uh, Richard had some of the characteristics, but not enough to diagnose. And what made him unusual is they said that he wasn't a serial killer but that yet he they title it he was what was called a thrill killer okay and i've i've seen that before i you know i've i've heard and seen that before from other people and um um it was stated by the judge that sentenced him that as um as Richard is being the most brutal, callous, vicious beyond any human understanding than he's ever seen in his courtroom in his life, in his professional career. And and he had seen some things, you know. I mean, he's dealt with sentencing of other criminals and murderers, if you will. And what puts, what puts, a, what puts a person in that position? Now, see, most serial killers, have goals they have certain individuals that they stalk for a long time before they do anything you know it's a buildup. richard ramirez was all over the place he was crazy random he would just go to a house walk up on it see if the door was unlocked and if not try a window if it's not unlocked, he would move on to the next one and try that one there was no no reason rhyme or reason to his his activities Except for the fact that, you know, besides wanting to thrill kill, he was looking for money and valuables to support his drug habit. That's all it was. Well, his his first case, uh, the first documented case of murder that he committed that they know of, uh, took okay. place on April 10th, 1984, where he murdered and raped nine-year-old 
Mei Ling in the basement of the hotel where he was living in the Tenderloin uh, district of San Francisco. Um, he raped and beat the girl before stabbing her to death and then hung her body from a pipe. This was his first known killing. And uh, it just again, you see something like this, just to read about it makes me sick. And I wish I would have been there to save that little girl's life. Uh, it just makes you sick. You know, it really does. And, and you just, uh, what kind of individual? And this could go back to what I've talked about before. Some people are born into what I call being a bad seed. They are incorrigible from the beginning because they are a part of the satanic seed line. So they can't be good. They, it's impossible for them to be or do good because they're born of this satanic seed line. And I wonder, you know, again, anyone that could commit such a uh, just vile, wicked and heinous act such as this um, very well may have been a bad seed from the beginning. You know, um, yeah, I would, I would go, say because he was, yeah, he was convicted of 43 crimes and 13 murders, and they said that they're certain that there were far more murders than 13, yeah. but that was the only ones they got him on. I would be willing to bet on that, yeah. And it was interesting, you know, you called him like a thrill killer there, and um, certainly doesn't tick the usual criteria for your typical serial killer, like you said there, Lara. And that was one thing that really struck me. The the levels of violence, the randomness to it, letting some survive, mm -hmm. others not surviving. And then people were literally, I only really got an appreciation for this today, but people were literally living in fear in LA and San Francisco when this was at the height of its kind of wave, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I actually got that information. Um, there's a video on YouTube by a Dr. Tob, Todd Grande, and he's a mental health doctor. And he, he's, he, he did a humongous deep invest. He does all the serial killers. You can actually go online and, and, and watch all of his videos on all the major um, famous serial killers. And, and he does diagnosis on them. And um, he is actually the one that um, mentioned that he was considered that Richard Ramirez was considered a thrill killer, not a serial killer, because he doesn't meet the criteria. Um, what I did want to tell you is that outside of uh, narcissism, he also had um, antisocial personality disorder. Now there are seven criteria that you have that 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 are within that. Uh, um, diagnosis, and you only have to have three to be diagnosed with that. And he met all seven of the criteria. Uh, one was uh, repeated unlawful behaviors. Two, consistent deceitfulness. Three, impulsivity. Four, aggression. Five, reckless disregard for safety. Six, irresponsibility. And seven, lack of remorse. And they can they they tie they they straight up said that he was a pure like completely and purely a psychopath one hundred percent through the core of his entire heart mind body and soul. Yeah, and again, you know, think about this. I can't tell you how many times I've been involved in cases to where people had mental illness, but the spiritual ties into that. So uh, this goes back to what I've stated many times before, that all life operates on frequency and vibration. So if we are on high frequency, high vibration, life is good, life is positive, we're moving forward. But if we're on low, life is a challenge. And, and if mental illness is present in such a situation, well, then the devil will exploit that. So he will bring that spiritual stronghold into a mental illness type of situation. And certainly he will uh, inflame that and amplify and magnify that. So, Travis, do you have anything for Laura? <laughs> Take myself off mute. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, well, what I was I was gonna make uh, a, a, an observation and, and then a question, Laura, because uh, obviously Bill and Kev and I were talking before bringing you on, and serial killers uh, 
probably fall second on my list of interests uh, outside of the paranormal and the supernatural. Jack the Ripper has always fascinated me, Son of Sam, the Zodiac Killer, and of course Richard Ramirez. But obviously not an area that I have done a great deal of research into. But you mentioned that he it was very hard to diagnose him, that it was very hard to, to pinpoint uh, what he actually was. So obviously he, he's on the spectrum of dissociative identity disorder. And uh, as a th- the, yeah. term, the term thrill killer, has that, is, uh, is that a, a broad enough term that there are other killers who have been lumped into that category? Absolutely. That's very interesting. Kev, what do you think? I, I think this part of it's what separates it from the other cases we've looked at. That there's something entirely different about this one. And I believe, Lara, maybe you'll be able to correct me on this, but it wasn't until maybe the fourth or fifth time that we started to see the kind of um, the, the satanic type of symbols and things left around the crime scene. Is that correct? That sounds right. Because he didn't used to do it. It came, like, like right towards, like, the, like after... Yeah, that, that's, yeah what kinda, like that's what kind of made me um, note it down because it's almost as if um, that was something that came later. Maybe it came with a, a comfort that he had acquired, maybe he got used to it. I don't know, but something seemed to change. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, it's almost as if something changed at that time. But I'll get your take on that. Well, he, he, Richard Ramirez had mentioned in some interviews that, um, that he would try and fight his urges, but he would literally feel like an evil force rise up inside of him. And he knew it was Satan. Now, one of his, uh, attacks, he was, uh, trying to strangle, I believe it was a young girl with an extension cord and it sparked and it freaked him out because he thought that god was intervening and he he dropped her and ran and he left her she she survived now oh no that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah he felt that, that god was intervening to save her and he had to get out of there and he left her the way she was and she survived that attack and he never went back that's the thing is most serial killers they have a, a eyeball for somebody and they you know like they stalk people usually and um he did not do that he and and uh for him to feel that god was intervening you know because he felt that he was the son of satan so when he thinks that god is intervening um i think that he felt that like he probably felt in his inside of him that that if he continued to hurt this girl that he was going to be killed by god like you know i don't know uh, he he's just like he's his own own yeah. entity i don't know that, i mean bill i'll bring you in here i mean you could look at that two ways well there's a number of ways you could say the guy is absolutely totally insane or perhaps perhaps right being pure evil Whatever it was within him, uh, reckon, yeah, I would yeah, vote for number two. yeah, yeah. What, whatever it was within him, it all, it sounds like it recognised the power that it was up against in that one case, um, as opposed to, I don't know. It's almost like this guy. I don't want to take anything away from him, but it's almost like he's possessed at times. You know. Well, not almost, because again, an individual like this is willingly given himself over. And even uh, in these circumstances in childhood, going through certain types of traumas, uh, like Laura had mentioned about him taking two traumatic hits to the head, knocked unconscious, um, those are traumas. Those are physical traumas, but they are also spiritual mental traumas as well. And that in itself is enough to open the doorway for demons to come in. And then when you factor in the uh, dynamic of the family life, and then you factor in his rebelliousness and having that influence from the the cousin on literally teaching him how to kill and then seeing all these things at a young age on, um, you know, the way to kill and then rape and all these other kinds of things. So, uh, again... 
this individual was putty in the hands of the devil that he could work through this uh, through his cousin Mike uh, to shape him into this killing machine, uh, the, the killing machine that he was. Now, was he also a part of any satanic church or anything like that, or was he just, you know, himself dabbling, Lara? Do you know anything about that? There's absolutely nothing um, that is out there as far as him being involved with any type of satanic church. They said when he turned 18, that's when he started worshiping Satan. But I know he was playing around, like, trying to scare people in school because he did, like, introvert. He went quiet, and I do believe that was just the drugs. And then um, it stated that, it, it you know, like, people knew by the time of 18 he started worshiping Satan. And um, from 1978 to 84... Um, he was arrested. That, that's when, like, major crime spree started happening, like, uh, for stealing cars and, and crimes like burglary and possession. And in 79, um, that's, like, when he gave up hiding. So, like, he started his crimes in 78 and 79. He just, like, started, like, physically going to Kaka, you know, just, you know. And then uh, he kept going until 84, but in 83, he tells a relative that Satan was hit, was protecting him. And soon after that, after he said that, is when he started committing the murders. Whoa. Now, and Tra I'll bring, yeah, I'll bring Travis in here then. Travis, what do you make of that kind of um, statement that was made to the family there? I have to apologize. I had you guys on mute, that's and I okay, did not brother. hear her statement. That, that's okay, brother. Bill. You know, he's telling the family or somebody in the family, you know, Satan's got his back. It certainly builds the case that you're making for this guy being a, an instrument, you know? No question about it. I mean, there is, and, and furthermore, Kev, all one has to do, truly, if you really want to tune in to a person, you can tune in to a person, you can read a person, just take a good look at them and look into their eyes, and you will get through what I call holy discernment, uh, you'll feel the evil. You'll feel if they're good, and you'll also feel if they are evil. Now, in my case, and, and many other people as well, God has given me the uh, gift uh, to be able to see through a person's eyes and literally see demons behind those eyes, and I praise God for it. It is not something of my own accord. But uh, that's what I say, first and foremost, is take a good look at anybody that looks at Richard Ramirez's picture, take a very good look, and that saying a picture's worth a thousand words, you will have your answer right there. Yeah. Yeah, big time. I agree. I, I, don't you know, think I, I don't think I've ever laid eyes on somebody that, even if I didn't know anything about this cat, I'd be like, that, that's a bad dude. You don't want to be left alone with him. He, he just yeah. looks evil. He oozes it. Well, you know, I mean, it just oozes out of him. It did. And you know, there's a time where he actually, while in prison, he got that, he got married and he was like, kind of like acting normal finally. Like he was just like starting to become like a, a normal person because where are you going to go? He's sentenced on death row, right? So he, he, and then Something else happened. No one knows what it is, but he completely shut down emotionally and mentally, verbally, like, and he stopped. He wouldn't even see his wife. He wouldn't see family members, no nobody. He wanted no visitors. He didn't want to talk to anybody, and he completely shut down. And then I believe it wasn't too long after that um, when, he, when he got sick and, and died. Now, an interesting little side note here on that is that uh, there was a lady named Doreen uh, Alloy, I guess that's how you pronounce her name. Uh, it says, by the time of the trial, Ramirez had fans who were writing him letters and paying him visits. Beginning in 1985, Doreen Alloy uh, wrote him 75 letters during his incarceration. In 1988, Ramirez proposed to her and on October 3rd, 1996, they were married in San Quentin. 
Um, for many years before Ramirez's death, Loy stated that she would commit suicide when Ramirez was executed. However, Loy eventually left Ramirez, and by the time of his death, Ramirez was engaged to a 23-year-old female writer. So um, uh, it, that's interesting, and maybe that was part of his uh, sudden turn about, you know, is that this woman, uh, the, the one that he married, you know, finally left him or whatever, and maybe that threw him into some kind of... Uh, um, you know, uh, dark way or whatever again, and and then he meets up with this uh, twenty three year old uh, female writer and and gets engaged to her. So who knows? Well, did you also know that one of his jurors was murdered? Yes. Trial. And yeah, I read that too. Were, yeah, they were thinking he had it arranged, but what happened was the the woman's boyfriend. Um, killed her, and then um, soon after that, he ended up committing suicide. But what I feel like, honestly, like if he was like super into being, you know, a devil worshiper, a Satan worshiper, who's to say that he didn't put that out there to make that happen? Because for why? Why? Did, I mean, it's just crazy. Charles Manson certainly uh, had some... Uh events like that take place around him. So uh, again, uh, nothing would surprise me when it comes to these types of individuals. And and just as uh, most of us pray every day that God will work through us to be a blessing to others, people like that, you know, they're, uh, they are setting out on a daily basis to be curses to others and, and to be death to others. So it wouldn't surprise me for one second that uh, much of the same as Manson, having those evil abilities by invoking the power of the devil to create these types of scenarios and situations. And of course, when you're somebody that's high profile as well, Lara, you've got people out there that Richard Ramirez probably has never even heard of that are absolutely fascinated by him, almost like his, for lack of a better term, want to be his disciples. They want to go out in his name, you know? And that's another thing that I would really like to get into and talk about maybe on another show is what what drives a person to want to get romantically involved with a notorious huh. killer, murderer that's sitting in prison like Charles Manson got. And I think he almost got married or he did get married. He did. I can't remember. Yeah, he did. Okay. Yeah. Richard Ramirez. All of them, and it's just like these women flock to them, like, like, like if it's Elvis Presley. Because yeah. some women like bad boys, and they are drawn to the bad boys, and it's exciting for them. Yeah, the the kind of you know, big, the big Netflix you, you, documentary you, you, as well. I'm sorry, Lara, but that had a similar thing, and um, that's the making of a murderer. And then season uh -huh. two, the the main guy in uh -huh. that. It showed you that yep. he went and got married, but it was like a string of women, Lara. This has always baffled me as well. Some chicks just yeah. like it crazy and dangerous, I suppose. There you go. Well, it's it, but the thing is, they can't get crazy and dangerous if they're in prison forever and on death row. That doesn't make sense to me, except for like Charles Manson's little wife. She wants she she did it for personal gain. She didn't do it for love, which yeah. is. You know, okay, but you still are going there. You're visiting him. You're kissing him. You're probably having sex with him. That's it. Just, I can't even think. I can't even think about it. it wants, uh, I'm gagging now, over. Now here. you, now Sorry. you just, now you just made the interview weird, Laura. You just <laughs> went and just made it weird. <laughs> so, you know what? That, that, those are what happened. Those are the things that they that, that happen. They have family visits. I know all about that stuff. You know, and it's just like they do. So, so Travis, let me bring you back in here, brother. Um, you've been, you're probably full of questions for Lara, so I'll give you the floor right now. Um, ask away, brother. It's all yours. No, I was going to say, I, I agree with, with what you and Bill were saying. I, I do think that these individuals like Manson, like Ramirez, uh, that have this, this female following, I do think that it, it, a part of it is that old adage that, you know, women like a bad boy. Uh, I also think it is inherent uh, in, in female nature to want to rehabilitate when they see something wrong. Correct. When they, yeah. think, they think they can help. 
Uh, it, it, it is like an inherent maternal instinct that, that kicks in. I and agree. the other thing, I think, I think it comes, Laura, exactly what you said, you know, how can it be a, a thrill seeking because they're confined, they're probably going to die in prison or execution. And I think that is the big payoff. You get the association with fame, you get your 15 minutes, you get to say that you are married to or involved with a notorious killer. That's never going to see the light of day. So there's this, there, I think in a messed up way, there is an element of safety that is combined with that thrill seeking. Yeah. That's a good point. I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. And I, I, I just still, it just is like gross. The whole thought of it is gross to me. I oh. can't. So Bill, what other, what other questions do you have for Lara while we have her here? Well, I mean, I think she's done an outstanding job in in presenting this. Um, again, this individual, we're talking about someone that uh, is in the upper or lower echelon, however you want to state it, uh, of these serial killers, uh, was unique in many ways, but much the same in many other ways. And uh, thank God that he's not on this earth any longer. And so, again, for me, and some people might think this is harsh, and, and I really do. I love everybody, and I have helped people from all walks of life around this world, and will continue to do so. But there has to be a consequence for bad actions. And unfortunately, we're seeing the result of that today uh, by no actions or punishments being taken against those that are acting out in just the most terrible of ways. So uh, in a case like Ramirez and, and other people like him, if it were me, uh, I would certainly have capital punishment back because you would have to set this example that, look, if you are going to do these types of incorrigible acts against the good and decent citizens of America or around the world, you are going to have a more severe consequence than what you've done. So you'll suffer worse than your victims before you leave this earth. And that is the only way, I'm sorry to say, that you could really rein it in as far as having a true civilized society to where there is law and order because these people would think twice, you know, if they would have to think, if I do this, I'm going to be facing that. And I really think it would be a great deterrent against a lot of these types of actions. And again, somebody like Ramirez, putty in the hands of the devil. Uh, the devil brought all of the necessary ingredients into his life to shape and mold him into this monstrous killing machine. Well, think about this now. Um, I've seen people in the chat talking about this earlier. Algo, he's going to be on my show um, in August. But um, yeah, Richard Ramirez, we've just talked about him. Um, we're going back to that kind of time of Manson as well, that kind of generation, Bill. And there's one big difference between that time then and this time now. And it's the amount of young people that are on SSRI drugs, as well as, you know, the, the super strong marijuana and everything else that's going about that may be contributing. We're seeing some of that craziness starting to make its way out onto the streets everywhere now. You could be looking at a, a serious wave of maybe not as heinous and violent as Ramirez, but certainly people getting triggered for the slightest of things, you know? Look, we had the kid a couple of years ago that uh, was under the influence of Flacca and went and ate the man's face, you know, killed the man and wife in their garage in Florida and ate the man's face mm -hmm. while under the influence of... So we're seeing this, and, and when people... Are, and whatever it is that brings down their frequency and vibration, whether it is circumstances like Ramirez, uh, Manson, um, people that are under the influence of alcohol and or a drug, something that is lowering the frequency and vibration that makes them vulnerable and wide open for demonic attack, and then can enter into that person and literally make them a killing machine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Travis, any – on you go, Lara, on you go. Oh, oh, okay. I was just going to tell you guys that I was just recently watching a series on um, Henry Lee Lucas. Oh, another and, one, yeah. 
Uh huh. And at the end, you know, he was all crying because he didn't want to die, and they wanted to overturn his, you know, get him off death row and everything. And my initial knee jerk reaction was like, "Oh, now you feel bad? Too bad." And then as a Christian, I was just like, "One, oh, but everybody can change." And I'm like, "But that's too bad. He has to pay for his crime, you know." But I, and I was like so confused on how to feel because I mean, he killed way, 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 way more. He than sure did. And, and I'll say this, Laura, I feel, again, do I have all the answers? No. Um, but I feel that if a person is authentic, and believe me, you're not going to con God. There's no person on this earth that is going to con God. And if they think they are, I got a bridge I'll sell them. Um, <laughs> so if a person is sincere and they say, oh, dear God, please forgive me, I am grieved. I am so sorry for these wicked and heinous acts that I've done. I'm truly sorry. Forgive me. Then perhaps God could have mercy on someone like that because they are truly distraught. They're truly repenting. They're truly sorry. But in most cases, with men like Henry Lee Lewis, uh, Lucas, or uh, uh, Ramirez, or Manson, you know, people like that, they're not. It's just not in them to repent. So, you know, it, it, chances are that he was playing a game. And even with Berkowitz, son of Sam, you know, he is still incarcerated now and he supposedly turned his life over. Um, I would have to see it to believe it. Is it possible? Yes. Uh, again, if a person is truly repentant and, and they're grieved uh, to no end in their spirit, uh, but uh, I would have to see it to believe it. And chances are with these types of people, you know, they're capable of doing and saying anything to get the advantage. So I, I wouldn't trust it. And I'll, I'll put it to you like that. Mm -hmm. that's, what you, that's why I battled with my emotions on it, because, I, you know, it, you know, I just I was trying to put my Christian head into it instead of just being a regular person, you know, that sure. doesn't. And it was just I, I was just like, I felt so bad for feeling that way. You know, and then it was just like, well, no, maybe I shouldn't feel bad because what if that was my mother or my sister or, you know, and and uh, and I, I, I have I have compassion in my heart for everyone. But sure. when you live by the sword, die by the sword. That's how I see it. And, and again, uh, what you're saying is very true and very correct. And, and, you know, when we are walking with God and we're keeping God first, of course, we're to have mercy and love and compassion for others, of course. Um, however, I still, and a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but I'm sorry, uh, I still abide by the Old Testament, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So um, if something like that takes place, then I feel that the perpetrator should suffer far worse than what they made the victim suffer before leaving this earth. They have no rights, uh, in my opinion. When someone mm -hmm. takes the life, they have taken the life and the rights of others. Therefore, they forfeit their rights. They don't have any rights, in my estimation. So therefore, uh, they are no longer a productive citizen on this earth. They're incorrigible because they've done such wicked and heinous acts. Therefore, they have no right to life or to be here on the earth among the good and decent and law-abiding citizens. So it would be my position, and again, who am I? Uh, but it would be my position You're to building. take that what position. What do you mean? No, no, I'm, I'm nothing. Believe me, it's just God working through me. But if I were the leader, if I were suddenly appointed the leader, this would be my stance on things that, hey, look, uh, everything has a consequence. And if you are going to be on our earth and you're doing these types of wicked and heinous acts, then there is going to be a far worse consequence for those actions. So I think that, again, would be a great deterrent for some of these people because they would know what they were facing. But you're not talking about people who are, you know, if they have to kill out of self-defense. That's not. No, I mean. absolutely not. I mean, you know, I'm talking mm -hmm. about the, the Ramirez type of individuals, these mm -hmm. wicked people that set out to do um, – the most vile and heinous acts against people on a daily basis. And so uh, those types of people, the Charles Mansons and uh, the Henry Lee Lucas and uh, the Bundys and uh, the Gacy's and all those types, they didn't have any place in our society. Furthermore, they didn't want any place in our society because they're like unruly children. 
And I'll tell you this right That's now, correct. and what's happening in our nation is a prime example of that right now. If you allow a child to be unruly, well, guess what? They're going to be. And if you are giving the child a green light to be unruly, well, they're not going to take an inch. They'll take a mile. And furthermore, they're not going to take a mile. They're going to take 10 miles because they can, and nobody's doing anything to stop them. And this is why we are where we are as a society right now. I agree 100%. 100%. I see that's the difference between, like, like I used to get the belt or – my dad would make me go out to the front yard and pick a switch off of a dead tree. Right? There has to be a consequence. The same thing in my day. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you, you feared your parents because you feared that if you did something wrong, there was going to be a punishment and a consequence for it. Right. And with my daughter, she, you know, now we had, when, when I had my daughter, uh, now we all of a sudden have all these rules. You can only spank open-handed, you know, and only three swats, you know. And before Cheyenne would get her punishment, now I could count on one hand how many times she got spanked, but, like, I would squat down to her level and talk to her and tell her we, and, and explain, you know what you did was wrong, right? And what, what did you do that was wrong? And she would have to explain it to me. And so you know what that means, right? Right. And so you're going to take your punishment like a big girl, right? She'd be like, yes, mommy, you know, and, and. That's I being a good, you, responsible I'm... parent. You're in and, charge and I... of your children and we should be in charge of them and be in charge of shaping their lives. I agree. And, and I feel like, you know, I, I tell her, I said, I'm so glad you're not these cry babies. I can't take it. You know, these victims they are constantly a victim of everything and you know and she's a strong independent female with a thought and mind of her own but with compassion and she has god in her heart and you know and it's just like it's, it's all these things like she just turned into this I, I didn't expect this from her you know it's just like i expected her to be a good person but i didn't expect what has what has come about and she knows just as much as I do about all these horrible things. I mean, she lived right next door to the Cecil Hotel where all – she lived in that uh, apartment complex a couple buildings down from the Cecil Hotel when that Asian woman died and was put up in that water tank. We, she lived there. And yeah, the God bless well, her that she's turned out yeah. so well and, now. And Lara, I'll need to get yeah. you. I'll need to get you to come on my show to talk about the, the woman in the water tank. That case is bizarre. Oh. It truly is. Oh, it is so freakish. It is beyond words. I'm telling you now, like, the the whole spectrum of that story is, like, whoa. Yeah, like, I mean, really. I, I remember kind of covering it on the show when it was happening, when the, the news was coming out. I'm definitely going to get in touch with you. I'm definitely going to book you up for that. But, Lara... What, any last thoughts for the audience about the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, anything at all before we let you get back to your day? Well, <laughs> uh, well, the only thing I can I could express to people is he's not the only one. And you passed probably almost, I would probably say somewhere like 75 to 100 murderers in your lifetime in, in walking outside. Okay, you 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 cross the paths with people who have already murdered that much within your lifetime, and don't ever put your guard down. I'm very protective. I'm very on on my on my defense physically. I'm always looking around, always knowing what's going on around me. He's not the only one. He's not going. He's there's many more, and just to be vigilant. And we are in crazy times, and people have lost their thinking minds. They have gone completely batty. Yeah. And yeah. I don't go anywhere. I'm going to tell you now, you know, I, I don't go anywhere, and it's not because of COVID, because you already know me, Bill. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a feisty woman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you're wise no, in the sense that you're careful because you have to be now. I mean, we're, we're living in times now where you've really got to have eyes all around you and, and always watching your back because this is what's taking place. So many good and decent people are being victimized now. 
Yeah, and you know I, I have my lady mother here. I take care of her. She lives with me. And, you know, Wonderful I don't like ladies. Me. Oh, she's And I, Diane. But, <laughs> but, you know, you got to look out, not just for yourself, but, you know, you got to look out for your loved ones, too, and your friends. I you agree. Know? Just be smart and be mindful. Watch, you know, like, you know, just in closing, I remember a time where I was driving my car and my daughter was probably like eight. And this guy pulled up next to us and he looked over it. He was on the passenger side in his car and he looked over at Cheyenne and she like throws up and she's like smacking me. And I'm on, I'm on my phone, you know, on the uh, audio and I'm like, what? And I looked at the guy, and I've never seen pure evil coming from someone's eyes in my face like that in my life. And then it happened again on the 101 freeway in, uh, in the San Fernando Valley. This guy pulled up next to me, and, like, just the evil that was pouring through their eyes, I literally, like, had to get off the freeway, you know, and, and ditch him because I, I, I had never felt fear like that before. And they're out there and they are driven by evil and they have evil inside of them in more ways than we can comprehend. And you just got, you've got to be careful out there no matter what. Very well said, Lara. Well, I have um, thoroughly enjoyed listening to you today. It's been lovely to meet you. I would love to get you to come on the Kev Baker show and we'll uh, get into that weird case of the girl in the tank. Um, Bill, any final words for Lara before we... We let her get back to her day. She's had the Kev Baker interrogation now, you know. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lara, for coming on. Uh, we've truly appreciated it. You've been great. You gave a great presentation. We look forward to you coming back. And I know uh, Kev is very interested in that case, so I'm sure he'll be in touch with you to bring you back on uh, with him. Oh, I'm all about it. I'm, I'm, a, I work from home, so let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. I've got a show every day of the week, so um, I'll get Bill to get in touch with you. I've got your number now. But Lara, thank you so, so much for coming on today and sharing that with us. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It was an honor and a pleasure. And Travis, it was so nice to talk to you again. I'm sure I'll catch up soon. And Bill, you better. all my love. Thank you. Love so it. God bless you and your mom, and we'll talk soon. All right. All right. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye. Bye bye. I'm just right. gonna bye. hang up on that there. Give me two secs, guys. And there we go. There we go. Wow, that was um that Amazing. was really, really good. Yeah, everyone you bring on to the show is good. I mean, Travis was that good. We we kept them on from last week, but you better yeah. believe it. And he added something again to this. So, I mean, it was great. It was great that we were all able to uh, listen to her presentation and then add a little something with questions of our own. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Travis, what did you make of um, what Lara was talking about there? It's one of the yeah, I... weirdest cases, the most violent case for me. It's not a serial killer. She's right. I don't know if I'd like to call it a thrill kill like the police did, but this guy was, um, he's off the charts, wasn't he? He, he, absolutely. I was going to ask you guys. Actually, I, I, I wanted to ask Laura, and I forgot. Um, you know, it seems like to me the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, there were serial killers, and I'm using that term very broadly, uh, were, were fairly prominent. Uh, you know, you had Manson. You had the Green River Strangler. You had the Night Stalker. You had Son of Sam. You had the Zodiac Killer. Uh, you had the BTK Killer in the 90s. You don't hear Golden about State killers, Killer. Go, yes, but you don't hear about serial killers anymore. And, I, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying, don't you yeah. find it odd that we, we've gone, you know, what, two decades and there's not been? So you know, are, have serial killers evolved to the point that we can't, we're not even detecting a serial killer? Or Bill, from a from a spiritual standpoint, have we seen evil jump ship and go in a different direction? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, for me, I think they just disguise it better because, again, where we have two thousand people a day in America that go missing, so I mean, uh, some of that certainly could be attributed to serial killers. But for some reason, 
Um, you know, has the media turned away from that now? Does that not fit their narrative anymore? Is it not exciting to report those kinds of cases? I don't know. But the uh, and here's another interesting thing. Uh, just think about this: the the bulk of those killers that you mentioned, uh, a lot of them were operating in Los Angeles and San Francisco. I find that very interesting as well. Yep. And you know, we 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 didn't even mention Ted Bundy. <laughs> exactly. He's another one. Uh, the Hillside Stranglers. Uh, you know, yep. Kenneth Bianchi and his cousin. Um, it, it could go on and on and on. And again, I say, for whatever reasons, the bulk of those serial killers and those killings took place in either Southern California and or San Francisco area. It's very interesting. Why is that? I don't know, but it is very, very strange. <laughs> Weird. That it seemed to have been, yeah, conglomerated uh, for the most part in those cities. I remember watching um, mm -hmm. one documentary at one point, and uh, worryingly they said that it was one of the FBI analysis units, and uh, they predicted, they thought that, they feared, possibly a couple of hundred, between two and three hundred serial killers could be operating in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at that given time. That, that's just in one country. Yeah, that's, right. And like you say, you know, Travis, I hadn't really ever thought about this. Um, it is interesting how you don't really hear about this anymore. Has it become lost no. in um, all the other stuff out there? I don't, I don't know. That's weird. It really is weird. It is, and, and and not just in this country. You don't hear. I mean, we don't hear about serial killings, and right. they're using that term very broadly. We we don't hear that in any country right now. Um, I so that's why I said, when I said. Has evil jumped ships? I mean, ha has it has evil itself evolved into a well, a, a whole new type of evil that we, we've yet to even scratch the surface and you know, understand um, and see? And maybe, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe back then, you know, I look at technology a lot, and sometimes I think some of the connections to evil can be over egged. However, that being said. That being said, you know, back 60s, 70s, 80s, we weren't creating portals into other worlds. And literally the only foothold that perhaps evil could get in this world was by indwelling somebody, for lack of a better term. Maybe now it's actually mm -hmm. gained a presence, an actual presence throughout the planet, for lack of a better That's term. That's a good point. I don't know. That's a very good point. It's a, and it's a very interesting theory that should actually be be fleshed out and 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 looked at and analyzed and discussed a little bit more because I think you're absolutely on to something there, Kev. That yeah. we have, you know, e evil evil has to. Bill Bill knows that evil has to have a vessel for it to act to to inflict and cause harm. It has to have a vessel. Absolutely. And what you know. It is our ever evolving technology opening these portals, allowing that evil to possess different vessels now? Maybe not so much human vessels as other vessels. Yeah, very interesting. It is interesting. It really is. I've enjoyed covering this case. Um, I hate using the word enjoyed again because of the, the kind of dark topic we're on here, guys. But, Bill, I know you've got prayers to say for people as well. We could be here all night. Me, you, and Travis could talk all night long. I get that. We feeling. sure could. Yep, yep. We, we sure could. Yeah, and, and, and Bill, Bill, and I have a couple of times yeah. talked way into the morning hours. Yes, very, very true. And and so that's what I like about this is that we, the three of us uh, have very good interweaving uh, with each other, and and we are, all have something to say. And so it, it really is great how we can uh, go back and forth. And interestingly enough, you know, as we're talking, I've had a bunch more prayer requests come in. It's just amazing tonight. Uh, you know, this show out of any of the previous shows that we've done, for some reason, uh, by leaps and bounds, we are just getting uh, flooded with prayer requests. I was looking at my Facebook there. We haven't had any more coming into my Facebook, so I don't have any more to pass to you just yet, Bill. Thankfully, yeah. thankfully, there's no more. 
I've got a bunch here that I've got to say before I even start the final prayer. It's amazing. Um, so, and again, thank you to everybody out there that is tuning in and watching and listening. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And we certainly hope that you find it of value and of interest as well. And uh, just by your messages here with the uh, prayer request, uh, it's, it's amazing. And keep them coming. You know, we will do anything and everything that we can. And that goes for uh, my sessions as well. Uh, I'm currently not traveling due to the COVID garbage, uh, but I am just as busy, if not more busy than ever. And I'm doing all of my sessions, all of my spiritual de deliverances and exorcisms via Skype and or phone session. So uh, I'm continuing to do this every single day. So if you are out there and you are in, uh, in a really bad place in your life and you're in need of spiritual assistance, don't hesitate to contact me. You can visit BillJBean.com and you can email me directly from the site and uh, we will get back to you as, as soon as possible. So uh, in the meantime, keep your prayer requests coming and we certainly will read them and pray for you and your family. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Travis, I'll come to you. Um... You mentioned that you're into these types of cases that me and Bill have been covering. You mentioned the Jack the Ripper. That there's a, a case that you could probably do about a series of 10 shows on and still not scratch yeah. the surface. But um, I'm really looking forward to hopefully having you on a lot more, Travis, uh, to get into some of I these cases. It. And um, yeah, it's like the three musketeers here taking on the <laughs> yes. dark yes. forces, yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I agree. Will, I will join you guys any any chance that you want me. Let me put it that way. Any 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 show you want me on, I will be there. Sounds good Fantastic. to me. So, Bill, how about you take us into the final part of the show today? Um, I don't know. It, it's actually warm here in Scotland at 2 a.m. in the morning. If that isn't a sign of the <laughs> end times, I don't know what is, you know. <laughs> it was 101 here today, and uh, it's just uh, amazing. This, this month of July... And, you know, it does get hot here in Maryland, but uh, it, it's supposed to be, you know, in those temperature ranges for a while. So we'll see. It'll probably break some records. But, yes, uh, all the signs, in my opinion, are here that we are in these uh, last days. And what does that mean? Does that mean that everything ends? I don't believe that. I believe that it will be like, uh, uh, you know, when God does finally have enough, he's going to hit the reset button. And there is going to be a great and terrible day. And then uh, perhaps he will start everything all over again. That's beyond me. That's uh, in his uh, game plan. However, he will do it. So his will be done. Uh, and again, Kev, thank you. Uh, and Travis as well. It's been a great show again. I've enjoyed every bit of it and, and look forward to next week. And uh, we'll take everybody out. Uh, take us out here with uh, everybody's prayer requests that I have left here and, and the final prayer and, and thank all of you for, for tuning in and hanging with us again. And let's start by praying. Uh, I had this uh, prayer request come in as well. My cousin, John Harvey, his wife, Bev, uh, she's going to have to have a neck surgery. And so we pray for Bev. And, and pray that God blesses her and heals her quickly and restores her back to good health very quickly. Brenda Jones uh, wants us to pray for her kids and grandkids for their health and happiness, and we pray for them. And may God hear our prayers and bless them with great health and much happiness and peace and joy. Uh, we pray for Kim Susan Crump. May God bless her with everything that she's needing. Um, Anna Bean, no relation, uh, needing prayers right now. She She's going through a very difficult time and trying to heal from past hurt. Uh, she's having a difficulty forgiving as well. And Anna, forgiveness is every bit as much for us as it is for the person that we are forgiving. So I would urge you, just as Jesus would, to forgive because if you forgive, you are releasing all of that. So when we hold on to that, it's like a spiritual poisoning. So my best advice to you is to forgive and move forward. And we're certainly praying for you that God blesses you with everything that you are needing in every aspect of your life. Um, 
We pray for Crystal Townley. Uh, we're praying for her and her kids. May God bless them with everything that they are needing. Uh, Julianne Emmerich, uh, she has severe arthritis, and we pray that God will bless her with a healing miracle and take that arthritis from her. Uh, Diane Rendo, um, her friend lost her husband to stage four cancer a few weeks ago. Uh, he passed away in the home. And uh, this is for Rosemary Branson. And Rosemary, we're very sorry uh, to hear of this. And may God bless you and comfort you and help you to move forward. And you will see your beloved husband again in God's heavenly kingdom. Uh, and we pray for the Bergstrom family, uh, a very near and dear family to me, love them dearly. And Erica Bergstrom sent this to me. Um, we want to pray for her mom, Cindy, and her grandmother, Marie, and all the Bergstrom family. I love them all dearly, and may God bless them with everything that they are needing. And uh, that will wrap up the prayer request for this week. And um, now I want everybody to just relax, just let yourself go. I know that it's been a lot of information that we have really brought on you this week. And, and just like last week with Travis, um, we, we've given, given you a plethora of information again this week. And uh, though it was disturbing, I pray that you develop a wisdom and a knowledge and an understanding of how the enemy works. So right now, just relax yourselves and let's get your frequency and vibration back up. So we're going to leave you on high. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to visualize every wicked, horrible, negative thing that's ever happened to you or the things that might currently be happening, whatever it may be. And now I want you to see the magnificent light of God coming and swallowing up all that garbage. And Father, I ask that you send your giant warrior angels in to take all of these things out and off and away from everyone that's tuning in that may be having a problem and carry off these problems and these demons and these curses, hexes, vexes, and spells and strongholds and attachments, oppression, and even possession. And I ask that you have your mighty giant warrior angels carry them off and deposit them back into the pits of hell where they belong. Furthermore, Father, I hope and I pray that some that are joined in this prayer right now will consider to renew their everlasting covenant with you and make you first and accept your son, Yahshua, Jesus the Christ, into their lives. And in doing so, Father, we're not only gathered here in order for that to happen, we are also gathered here in order for them to be free from all of their afflictions and their curses, hexes, vexes, and spells and attachments and strongholds and legal rights and anything and everything. And by your mighty power, Father, and your mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, I bind and break the power over Satan and all of his demons, all of his fallen angels, all of his unclean spirits, all of his demonic powers and principalities, all of his curses, hexes, vexes, and spells, all of his demonic strongholds, all of his ungodly soul ties, all of his legal rights, all oppression, attachment, possession and all family bloodline curses as well, and anything and everything that the devil has built over any of these people out here that are seeking help. By your mighty power, Father, your mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, may it all be broken off of them now. May you set them free, and may they draw close to you and you to them. And may you bless them with an abundance of love, peace, joy, good health, and prosperity for life. May you loose the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 over them, and may everything that they do and everything that they touch be successful from this moment forward. Father, we give you the praise and the thanks and the glory for everything forevermore. In Jesus' name it is so. And now I declare all of you, by the power of God, that your frequency and vibration is back on high and your temple is clean. So, Kev... That's all I've got now for this week. And until next week, much love and God bless everybody out there. And thank you for being with us 
uh, on this journey. Absolutely, and I think you're a voice, Bill. Uh, that final prayer, I think it always leaves everyone on high. And Travis, thank you as well, brother, for being here. Really great to have you on. And then um, next week, guys, are, what, what's the plans for next week, Bill? Are we going to look at the Mandelas? Are we going to get into a bit of the paranormal? Yeah, let's... Let's uh, we, we'll interlink them. So I think we should really examine the new Mandela's, including scripture changes, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps some of the uh, latest paranormal UFO uh, related type of phenomena that has been taking place, uh, intertwined with all the chaos that is going on uh, in our world. Yeah, with it being 2020, there's been lots going on in that kind of field, but it doesn't get the wow factor that it would in 2019, 2018, you know? It's lost. I was covering a story about a potential black hole that's on the urge of our, or on the edge of our solar system. Now, any other year, if you heard about a black hole anywhere near the solar system, that would be everything coming to a stop, you know? This year, it just kind of got a brief mention, you know? Back, back page news now. It would have been front page news, and now with everything that's going on, it's back page news. Absolutely. So, Travis, thank you for being here, brother, and, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to next week already. Sounds good. I look forward to it as well. Thank you guys for the hospitality and the invitation. Love you both, and uh, God bless you guys, and I'll be talking with you this week. Absolutely. Fantastic. Fantastic. We love and you too, brother Travis. Tomorrow for Take listeners care, to the, sorry, Travis, um, for listeners to the Kev Baker show tomorrow, please join me on tfrlive.com. I'm going to have one of our favorites. He's Ben Emlyn Jones, and we're going to be getting into Skinwalker Ranch. We're going to be discussing everything that was in the Curse of Skinwalker Ranch series, and of course, Ben has done a deep dive and come up with lots of other stuff as well. So until tomorrow, folks, and until next week when we reconvene for Warrior Mode, be sure to um, tell all of the people around you that are close to you just how much you love them. Um, you just never know when the next time might be the last time. And with all of the messages that we received today, the prayers, everything else, remember to look out for your friends, your family. Here's a thought for you, okay? Why don't you phone a friend that you haven't spoken to so, since all this COVID-19 garbage has started? That's your mission that, that I'm setting you for the week. Just say hello. Just reach out to them. You never know. It might not be much to you, but it might be exactly what that person needs to hear. So until next time, folks, take care and God bless.